Welcome to our Diesel Done Right class. Appreciate you stopping out tonight. So our learning objectives tonight are review, review the fuel system on diesels, review the induction system, and some review best service practices. Now, one of the reasons we're doing this class, this isn't a full-blown diesel type class. We're not going to talk about this one in particular, that one, or that one, or that one. What we want to do is uh, kind of help you guys prevent comebacks, okay? Prevent uh, some expensive comebacks. Because if you do something like an injector pump on these things, or even injectors themselves, there are a bunch of common issues we see in warranty returns, okay, that we just want to give to you guys so you don't go through those. Because there's nothing worse than ha having to do a cab off on one of these things and, repair and doing a whole bunch of repairs, only to go and fire it up and have it coming back in two weeks, simply because... Uh, you may not have followed the the proper procedures. Now that's probably not your fault. You just didn't didn't follow them because nobody told you about them. And at the end of the class, we're going to get give you some links, an eight hundred number, and a website to go to to help you prevent these comebacks. Because man, on these diesel engines, this stuff is really really expensive, and it can really bite in the behind if if, if you get 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 yeah, yeah. I think you understand. So I'm just going to leave it at that. Yeah, let's start off with the basic diesel engine. Now, this is a little bit of review. Understand a diesel engine is a compression ignition engine. Okay, we've still got the four strokes, intake, compression, uh, power, or expansion, and exhaust. The big thing is there is no spark plug. Okay, we're going to bring in massive quantities of air. We're then going to compress that air. That's all we're going to compress. And that large amount of air into that small combustion chamber which a lot of times is the top of the piston itself is going to heat that air up to the point that when the ignition or the injection system does squirt fuel in that heat is sufficient enough to cause that diesel fuel to burn okay now you notice i didn't say it's explode diesel engine really diesel fuel really doesn't explode it burns it's got a lot slower combustion process than gasoline does that's one of the advantages to it, because as long as there's fire and there's fuel and there's air, we're going to be producing power the entire length of that compression or that, that expansion or power stroke at that point. Finally, we're going to go with our, uh, our normal exhaust stroke. Uh, the fire went out. We've used all the energy in there. We're going to push this out the tailpipe. Uh, before it gets to the tailpipe, though, one thing we're going to do is we're all turbocharged. We're going to use that wasted energy to help bring in those massive quantities of air. Now, a lot of our uh, noises and vibrations on these things, you go back to Ford 7.3 liter, I mean, that, that thing cackled like crazy. Uh, most people like that. It sounded like a real diesel. Well, if you come to the diesel engines of today's, your Cummins, your, your Duramaxes, your Power Stroke, you can hardly tell that they are a diesel engine until you get really, really darn close to them. A, they don't cackle. Okay, because of the evolution of the fuel systems, what, we're, what, what the manufacturer is going to do is we're going to put in a, a small, I'm going to use the term pilot injection, a little bit of squirt just to get the combustion process started, and then we will feed the flame. So that cackle we've heard, uh, which was the, the, the start of the burn, of the, the, these things have, have gone away, and, and they run, run really, really clean, and they run really, really quiet. So uh, that's where we're at today, and that's kind of what we're here. Now, uh, desired air fuel ratios. If we're talking a car, we're generally dealing with 14.5 to 1, 14.6, 14.7 to 1 uh, stoichiometric ratio for a gasoline engine. In reality, a diesel, when it's running correctly, is still going to be about 14.5 to 1. It's very close to what gasoline is. But because we've got this thing up here called excessive air, now that excessive air comes in because we're turbocharged. We're going to pack a whole lot of air in there and put that fuel in. A lot of these things, when they were idling, we're at 160 to 1. That's 160 parts of air to one part of diesel fuel. That's a heck of a lean ratio with this, and they run pretty good. Even when we womp on this thing and we're telling it, hey, I want some power out of this thing. Okay, we've still got about 25 to, or the 25 to 1 air fuel ratio at load. So this is where a lot of the fuel economy comes from. Okay. But a lot of the points to achieve this is we got to have that high compression. Now, now, if you go looking in your books or if you go looking in manuals for, well, what's the compression ratio or, or what's if you're going to do a compression test? And I don't know how many folks have done compression tests on one of these, but it's not just pulling out the spark plug and sticking the thing in there. It's uh, some of these engines, you got to pull the fuel injectors to do it. 
Others, it's uh, glow plugs come out, and hopefully they don't snap coming out at that point. But according to the manufacturers, such as Duramax, GM, uh, they want a minimum, that's the bare bones minimum of 300 PSI in compression. When we were looking at a car engine, we're looking at, what, 170? Now we're up in the 200s at one time on cars. Goodness, we were down at, well, 150 to 1 uh, compression ratios. These things are double that. Ford's Power Stroke 300, and then the Cummins that's used in the Dodge. We've got a minimum of 350 PSI. Compression isn't a, well, I want to say this. If you, well, just look down in blue on the bottom over there. Barrel plus uh, com- computed ratio times VE equals can- cranking compression. Okay, it's a mathematical formula. That's why a lot of manufacturers don't publish these numbers for you. The most problematic of those numbers is the volumetric efficiency, as it's based on engine design and cranking speed. So what if my batteries are a little low or my starter's a little wore out? Now the engine can crank at a lower speed, which is going to give us less compression ratio. So before we start doing this, we've got to make sure that uh, the basics are in good thing. Typical values, the number of cranking speeds are in the 55 to 60% range, which is what we're seeing here. Uh, listed here are the minimum crankings for these engines. So some base numbers for you at that. Oh, uh, so how do we get fuel into how, how do we make this thing work? Uh, diesel fuel is way heavier than gasoline, and it evaporates much, much slower. Uh, so in order to get the, this to be consumed and properly in a combustion event, fuel has got to be broken down into very tiny, small droplets. We've got to finely atomize it, if you want to call it. To do that, we need lots of pressure. That's why these uh, high-pressure pumps put out up to 30,000 PSI. In order to get this engine to start, though, because we're turning slower and we're using mechanical injection on these things, diesel engines require about three to 5,000 PSI of fuel pressure at the tip of the injector nozzle just to get this engine started. Most of our vehicles today, we've got scan data. We can go in and look at what that high-pressure fuel is and a lot of times you're going to see in there, it's cranking and cranking and cranking and cranking, and I'm nowhere near 3,000 PSI. A lot of times we're going to be a lot less than that. Uh, I, I've seen some of these crank at 1,500 PSI, 1,000 PSI. That is just not enough to get it started, and that's going to give, kind of give you your direction where you're going to go on these things. All right, now, the fuel on diesel engine is injected directly in the combustion chamber under that very high pressure, and the tip of the injector which sits in the combustion chamber, has multiple nozzles, a lot of little tiny holes in there to get that fuel to come out so that we atomize it or break it down into very tiny fuel droplets. Droplets are going to interact with that heated air in that cylinder, which are going to cause the fuel to burn. In order for proper combustion, an excess of air is, is necessary, as well as a strong motion or swirl of the intake air. Besides creating more power output, turbocharging assists in this process. If you look at this drawing of a combustion chamber, the tip of our injector sits in the middle. So when we start to inject this fuel, we're going to have a very, very rich mixture. As a matter of fact, there will be almost no air involved. As it begins to spread out and we get that air swirl, that air coming in, that pressurized air through the, through the valves, we're going to start to run this into our what we call the stoichiometric area, where it's going to where, where we've got the best burning. But remember. In that entire process, we are burning fuel. Finally, when we're going to get to the edge of that flame front, we're going to have a very, very lean mixture. This all equates to a good air fuel ratio for this so that we don't have a lot of the byproducts we had in the old days. The uh, modern diesel engine, the tailpipe should be spotless. No soot whatsoever. That's part of the the after treatment system on these things. Diesel fuel pressure. Uh, To increase this pressure, we're going to control the amount of fuel going in. As the engine speed increases, the amount of time available for injecting fuel in the combustion chamber at the right time decreases. This is an important thing. I need to get the correct amount of fuel in. If I'm sitting there at idle, I've got a lot of time, well, comparative a lot of time, for that piston to come down, piston to go up, for that fuel to come in while the piston to the top dead center and for it to ignite. Just think if you're doing 2,500, 2,000 RPMs or so, the amount of time to get that correct amount of fuel in has decreased greatly. So in order to get the same amount of fuel in, we've got to increase the fuel pressure. So you're constantly going to see this fuel pressure 
we over here look at the RPMs and look at the actual fuel pressure. As RPMs go up, so does fuel pressure to its maximum point. So we got to have that high amounts of pressure. So one of the things you might want to look at when you're diagnosing a, a, a power problem is watch your RPMs. Take it out and womp on it. And watch your actual fuel pressure. Also watch your desired fuel pressure. What does the computer want? What is it getting? It's going to get you on a diagnostic path to where you probably need to be on these things. All right, a little power tip over here. I mentioned before, on today's engines, that tailpipe should be clean. Okay, I'm sorry, there's no excuse for it to be black. This thing over here, that DPF, diesel particulate filter, filter is the key word. Its job is to catch all this soot that the engine might be producing and then have us go through regen processes to burn that soot away. Some of your areas that, that are very, very strict emissions actually put the thing through an opacity test. All right, a little bit about the fuel systems. We're going to kind of go through a few things because diesel injectors are a, are a thing that I don't care how well you take care of this truck, it's eventually going to need diesel injectors. So we're going to explain them, and these are one of the high warranty items that we see coming back. You guys have installed them. Something went wrong. We need to warranty for them. So all the injectors are tore apart in, in, in there. They go through some forensics. We do an autopsy on them to find out what went wrong. So we're going to talk about this a little bit. Back in the good old days. Now, yeah, back in the good old days. 12-valve uh, fuel, yeah, Cummins-style pump. Yeah, the old old, old Cummins motor, the 12-valve motor. Uh, we, we had a mechanical injection pump. Again, cam-driven, but all the injectors had hard lines from the pump to them. These were a mechanical injector. There was really no electronics involved. They had the fuel separator, the water level fuel heater mounted right on the engine. You may have had a mechanical fuel pump uh, bolted to the block in later models of this. They had you put an electric pump in a fuel tank. We were good. It did the job, unfortunately, would not meet emissions. When you talk about some of those injection pumps, the VE is a rotary pump. Uh, the fuel connections are over there. P7100, it looked like a little, little inline six-cylinder motor itself. This is what got the fuel into the engine at the correct time and at correct amounts. Everything was mechanical. If you had to do something here, you had to make sure you had the correct tools to, uh, to adjust them out. And then we started going here. The, the Cummins at this started to bring in electronics. We had an electronic module on here, the VP44 injection pump. Still pretty much a mechanical system, but bringing in more electrics. Uh, the electricals were the timing solenoids which modified the base rotor timing. Supply pump was inside to, to, to advance the timing. The fuel sol solenoid, uh, a lot of lubrication, and it, it held the same on here. We, we lubricated the internals of these pumps with diesel fuel, much like we do today on these pumps. Getting into some diagnostics and service tips. Pump style injector, a uh, pump style injector pumps, you have verified lift pump operation. You got a pump in a tank or on the block. We saw in there the mechanical pump moving things up. Make, make sure you got a good supply. Verify the power to cut off solenoid on a pump. One unique thing about these was if you, if you had a, a manual transmission with one of these and the battery went dead, you could still start the motor. As long as you could get the solenoid to open up and you could apply fuel and you could get fuel into this thing, you would roll it and you could bump start this thing in the way we used to do it in the good old days. Uh, that fuel solenoid was the way we turned the engine off. We simply shut fuel off to the pump and the engine would die. All right, these pumps did need to be timed to the engine. Uh, there was a shaft key on that VP44. Now, you may still work on some of these. That's why we're here. Still, we, we do make replacement parts for these. So understand what you need to do. And uh, don't drop that pump on your foot. It's heavy. It weighs a lot. Venerable Huey injector, hydraulically activated, electronically controlled unit injector. A Ford 7.3 power stroke, six liter power stroke use these things. What's unique about them is we used a low pressure fuel supply to supply fuel to the injectors, but to make that 40 to 60 PSI into something the engine could use, we would use engine oil pressure. The oil pump in a pan would bring oil up to the high pressure pump, we had a fuel pressure regulator, and in the inside, underneath the valve covers, were the log manifolds or the W-type manifolds to supply high-pressure oil 
for the injectors so that we could inject this fuel into the combustion chamber. Now, the whole secret that this thing was inside the injector, we had what was called an intensifier piston. The intensifier piston gave us a 7 to 1 mechanical ratio. So we would bring that fuel in at about 60 PSI, and through that, 70, that, that 7 to 1 mechanical ratio, we could increase it seven times at that point. The injectors were electrically fired, so that timed it at that point. There was no need to time the high-pressure pump to the engine. Lots of issues with these things. The injectors themselves, solenoid on the top. We did have oil coolers on these things. That oil cooler is replaceable. The mechanical pump that was mounted on top of the engine in the valley. The high-pressure pump was, again, mounted in the valley, driven off the cam gear. Then we had our fuel filter assembly, which, again, sat on top of the engine. Uh, this did have a fuel pressure regulator. You had a water and fuel, fuel uh, filter. Uh, or water and fuel sensor, the filters were designed to shed the water. A lot of issues here. The, the Huey injectors were one thing. Solenoids would give you problems. Uh, what we saw a lot of was guys would order new injectors, put the injectors in, and do and then do a uh, an injector test, an electric injector test on the engine with no oil in these things, and it would wipe the injectors out. So you just put eight injectors in, and you're sending eight injectors back because the thing won't start now. Never, never do that uh, injector balance test. That is the, the technical term Ford used was the buzz test. Never do that unless the engine has been running so that you've got oil in here lubricating everything. Down here was the tip. Part of that tip sat in the combustion chamber. There was a crush washer here. You've got an O-ring, an O-ring, and an O-ring. The reason this is important is down here in the bottom, these things were, were engine coolant cooled. Over here was the where the the uh, oil and everything came in. Down your bottoms, if these O-rings were an issue, you had issues with leaking things at that point. So a lot of these vehicles in service, over 2 million were produced in its lifetime. There's still a lot of them on the road. Like you can always hear a power a 7.3 coming because it makes all kinds of racket. Ford then went to the 6-liter, uh, still a Huey system. They did change the Huey. They went to a shuttle valve across here. This this one had, they started out with the log manifolds and they went to the W manifolds. A uh, lot of problems within these transfer tubes for leakage. I uh, had O-rings sealing the things. And because this was a system that put out a lot of pressure pulsations, a lot of times you would destroy these uh, rubber O-rings. They do have, they did have a, a recall in a technical service bulletin to put the new pressure regulator system on here. The rear of the camshaft sat, sat in the back. Uh, Issues with things over here. You had wiring harness coming in, which gave you issues. Underneath the vehicle, they had the diesel fuel conditioning module. This was the electric pump that fed the high pressure pump. It also contained a filter. That filter had to be changed. You had a uh, drain plug over here that you could drain water out of. A lot of times people never drain the water out, so it corroded down here. And uh, we eventually made this end cap available if it corroded out. You had your water and fuel sensor. Your fuel came through here and your fuel returned through here. When the engine was cold, they recycled some of the fuel from the engine to help heat things up. Still a lot of these are on the road. Uh, there's still a lot of people running these things. You're going to be doing some major repairs on these occasionally. Diagnosing and service tips for these. Yeah, with the Hueys, uh, oh man, we're going to stress this all night long. Any diesel engine, you must ensure good, clean fuel. Fuel is the killer of those injectors. You got to ensure on these Huey engines that you've got good oil supply and good oil level. Remember, we're going to use the engine oil pump, that crankcase oil, to supply oil to a high pressure pump. High pressure pump will then fill the manifolds. We're going to use that on the intensifier piston in the Huey. So, to do that, uh, we're going to need a minimum of 500 psi just to get this motor started on the high pressure side. Top of the cylinder heads. There were some plugs you could pull out and put a pressure gauge in to do some uh, no-start diagnosis. If I didn't have 500 PSI, that motor would not start. Internal oil pressure leaks were biggies. Remember, we saw all these fittings, all these transfer tubes, all with O-rings on them. Ford had a couple uh, service bulletins on, well, you replace this one with this one and this one with this one and go from that. The O-rings were an issue. They would get pounded, pounded, and the O-rings would leak. Now, the system was designed to handle some leakage. 
but it couldn't handle a lot of leakage. That's when you got your problems. Another big thing we see is those copper ceiling washers on the end of the injectors down over here. They got to be there. Now, both the 6 liter and the 7.3 did use a, an injector cup. That A lot of times when you pull the injector out, the cup may have come with it. There were special tools to put it back in. Do not reuse the old one. It's going to give you nothing but headaches. And make sure you can account for the old copper ring before you put the new copper ring in. Electrical performance, these were electrically fired injectors. You generally had a FICM controlling these things. There were performance codes for that. There were electrical issues. Broken wires are one of the big things. And like I mentioned, a lot of updated, new update parts for these things. Now, you may find an engine out there that hasn't had any of the update parts put in it because the owners have taken care of it, or maybe it doesn't have that many miles on it. You're going to get in for a problem if it hasn't had the updates done do it and even make sure you're using the newer updated parts when you're servicing these things. All right, let's get into something more modern, our common rail systems that we're using today. Just a generic overview over here. and We'll break down a few things. This is a high pressure system. We do have a high pressure pump. Uh, in the beginning, Ford and GM and Dodge all used the CP3 pumps. Ford and GM did go to the CP4 pumps. General Motors has gone to a new uh, pump. Uh, Dodge would prefer to keep the CP3, but Bosch kind of forced them to go to the CP4 pump. So there's going to be issues in there. Whole idea here was uh, this is a high pressure pump. We're going to feed it with low pressure fuel. 70% of the fuel that comes into this pump goes back to the fuel tank. So there's a high, high return system. Volume control valve is what's going to make your pressure. You do have a PCV valve, pressure control valve, commonly called. That's going to help to regulate this. The whole idea of this pump is let's make a lot of pressure and let's dump it to the rail. From there, we will go with some sort of a transfer tube to the injectors. Your injectors will be electrically controlled. They can be a solenoid injector or they can be a PZO injector. GMs, uh, the, the Duramax 6.6 .6 liter, CP3 pump, the uh, CP, uh, CP4 pump. GM did not use a lift pump. They used a, a garroter pump on the back of the pump. You can see some of the fins back here. They would actually draw the, the fuel from the tank. In the earlier models, they did have the FICM, and they went away from the FICM. Uh, early models, solenoid injectors. They eventually went to the uh, PZO injectors. And now they've actually on newer, I believe it's the L5P or LP5, they've gone back to a solenoid-style injector. These injectors all do return fuel, which is important to us. Pumps are cam driven. The new on the uh, on the new L5P engine, they've gone to the Denso fuel pump over here. Now they also went to a lift pump with the Denso pump. On the Bosch pumps, they didn't use a lift pump. On this, there is a pump in the fuel tank at that point. And then they're back to the solenoid style injection. So some tips on this thing is, again, we're going to beat the snot out of that tonight. Must use good, clean fuel. Uh, when you do an injector replacement or a high-pressure pump and re replacement, especially the high-pressure pump, you're replacing everything that fuel comes in contact with. If you're not replacing it, you're cleaning it. So my philosophy is if this thing's had metal go through it from that high-pressure pump, that fuel tank's coming down. If any fuel in it's going to get disposed of properly, and it's going to get fresh, clean fuel after we wash the tank out. Watch your uh, lift pumps. Ford and uh, Dodge use lift pumps. General Motors didn't, but they are now. And the big thing here is this thing needs 5,000 PSI to start. Just to get it started, again, watch your scan tool. Lots and lots of parts on this thing. Uh, basically, anything that's high pressure is a one-use item. If you're putting injectors in this, not only do you need the injector, but you need the fuel transfer line too. If you're putting a pump on this thing, there's a whole basket. Well, I'm going to say there's a whole pickup truck load, bed load of parts that need to go on with that pump because you're replacing everything. The Bosch CP4 pumps are very sensitive to contamination, which kind of takes us back to this one. In my opinion, there's no skimping on filters on these things. We'll come down to this last one. Some failures require complete fuel system replacement or flush. I talked about that. Yeah, if that pump goes, if that high-pressure pump goes, you've now put little fine metal particles, fine filings through the entire system. It's going to be expensive. 
do the job right. Don't shortcut it. Otherwise, you're going to have to pay for that expensive thing all over again. And it's just not worth it, guys. All right, like I mentioned before, in the Duramax, uh, we're going to use that garroter pump to actually draw fuel from the tank through the FICM on the earlier ones. Through our fuel filter assembly up underneath the uh, or up underneath the hood, it had a priming pump on it. That pump out, pump was in there. If you did replace this this fuel filter, do not attempt to start the engine unless you can't pump that pump no more. It's going to suck fuel from the tank forward and pressurize it going forward to the pump itself. They did give you a nice fuel uh, fuel pressure port to go there, okay, so use the gauge to do it. As far as supply testing at idle, remember we're negative pressure. Okay, you're sitting there idling. You're you're going to see if we're looking at in psi, a half to one and a half psi negative, or if you want to look at it in inches of mercury, one to three inches of vacuum on this thing. Hard acceleration, and the, and if you're checking fuel pressure on these things, you got to drive it like you stole it. Is a term I've heard. You see this one over here, this full load. You got to do that, and if you don't have this number, minus four to minus six, minus five to minus six, you've got a fuel restriction. You're going to be starving the high pressure pump. So these are some specs you want to look at for this thing. You got idle, hard acceleration, no load, and full load. You got to drive it under those. Now, something I want to bring your attention to is the Duramax fuel fuel pressure test port. That's what goes is up underneath the hood on these things. That's where you're going to put your pressure gauge. Now, remember, this is reading negative pressure. So uh, this thing works kind of like a tire Schrader valve. You got to think of this for a second. If this vehicle comes in with a cap, like I've got circle, or, or with this thing, like I've got a circle, no cap. This is a potential area of disaster, of problems. And remember that what's on the other side of that valve is negative pressure. What's on this side of this is going to be negative pressure. The higher pressure is going to be on the atmosphere. So there's a very good chance that when you get into situations like this, you're going to be sucking air into this thing. You're going to have a performance-related issue. Uh, it's got no power, and you're also doing damage to that high-pressure pump at that point. The cap that goes on that port is the primary seal. That's what keeps it from sucking air and keeps contaminations out. So make sure that cap, make sure it was there when it came in. If it's not, you got to warn the customer and you got to note it. Make sure it goes out with a new cap. Talking about the pump uh, pump before, uh, excuse me, the fuel filter assembly before. It sits on uh, underneath the, uh, the hood of the vehicle, filters on the bottom. That's coming up. That's going out to the rail and everything. This is your pump. Okay, that's your manual pump. When you change the uh, fuel filter, you can unscrew that, put a new one in. Some people partially fill the new filter with fuel with good clean diesel fuel, that's okay. But then you gotta push this thing, you gotta pump this thing until it doesn't pump anymore. Okay, it'll eventually quit going down, it'll be hard as a rock, that's gonna put it, put about 10 PSI to the high pressure pump. Now what's even more critical, you know, that's why we've seen lots of failures, lots of attempted warranties, is if you have had to replace that high pressure pump, you've replaced all the injectors, there is no fuel anywhere in this system you can't turn the key on and prime the system because there's no electric fuel pump. What you've got to do is after you put the clean fuel tank up and added clean, fresh diesel fuel, what you've got to do is stand here and push this thing and pump it and pump it and pump it and pump it. And you got to pump it until it no longer pumps. Then go start the engine. If you attempt to start this engine without priming this fuel system, there's a very good chance you've just wiped out that brand new pump you put in, and there will be no warranty given for that. Remember I mentioned before, every pump that comes back, whether it's new or returned for warranty, goes through an autopsy. And we can tell exactly what happened simply from the look of what's in that pump. So do yourself the favor and sit there until your thumb turns blue. Now, then go in and attempt to start the engine, let it idle. You may have to come back and pump that thing up again. So just be aware of that. That's the cause of a lot of, uh, a lot of comebacks on these things. These things are prone to leakage. We've got some plastic fittings in here. These square cut seals on here are the pump itself. They fit up and top the bellows. Because this thing doesn't get used that, all, that often, 
you're going to get a little water in here. It's going to cause some corrosion. It's going to hurt those seals. So remember, if this thing leaks, if you got a leak here, you're not, <clears throat> excuse me, you're not going to find a fuel stain. You will find a air leak. It's going to show up when you're putting your fuel pressure gauge on and going for a road test. What a lot of guys do, uh, especially on older ones, is they just replace this whole assembly just so that they don't have problems to prevent comebacks. Power stroke engine, uh, yep, Ford, uh, well, the earlier ones, the seven, three, six liters. Uh, you've got your fuel tank down here. They do use a lift pump. This one, they're gonna call it the horizontal fuel conditioning module. You've got your fuel filter, primary filter here. You've got your, uh, your water drain valve. Uh, there's also an electric pump in here. That's gonna feed fuel. We're gonna draw fuel from the, from the tank up into this thing, feed it to the secondary fuel filter. So you do have two fuel filters on this. We're gonna send that fuel then to the high pressure pump. High pressure pump, what fuel is not sent to the engines is used to cool and lubricate the pump itself. We're gonna return that back through the fuel cooler, run that back to the, uh, the fuel, upper fuel, the secondary fuel filter assembly, recirculate fuel, add fuel from the tank as we need it. It does use a, a, a fuel to water cooler so they do have their own separate cooling pump, their heat exchanger. They're also going to cool the uh, turbo actuator with this thing, and they will have a separate regu a separate reservoir for this. You need to service this stuff occasionally. Dodge Ram pickup truck. This is the lift pump. Some early 5.9 engines use a supply, supply pump mounted to the engine. They came out with a bulletin saying if that one on the engine goes bad, stick one in a tank. All the wiring was there. Just had to do some plumbing. Uh, they once upon a time did have a kit to do that with, but that has since disappeared. CP4 pump operation, just to tell you why these things fail the way they do. This is a Duramax example. So we're suctioning fuel. Now this is coming from the garroter pump that's mounted on the back of this pump. It's gonna transfer into the, what I'm gonna call the crankcase internally. First place that fuel does, and that, that garroter pump going to pressurize this fuel to 150, 160 PSI. That fuel is used to lubricate that camshaft or that crankshaft, whatever you want to call it. So everything here in yellow is that lower pressure fuel. What we don't use to lubricate and to cool is going to be returned to the tank through the fuel cooler assembly. Now also internal to this is going to be a passage that's going to transfer some of that fuel up over to fuel rail pressure regulator number one or fuel regulator pressure number one, a fuel volume control valve. This valve is assigned the task of making the fuel available for the high pressure pumps. The pistons that deliver the high pressure are mechanically driven from that camshaft or that shaft assembly inside there. Show you a picture of this in a little bit. The displacement of this pump chamber never varies. The way we're gonna change, our, vary our fuel pressure is by the amount of fuel we meter into those pumping chambers. So if I put a lot of fuel into here, we're gonna compress a lot, make a lot of pressure. If I put a little bit of fuel in there, we're gonna compress a little and make a little bit of fuel pressure. This thing reacts like in a heartbeat to the fuel demands. One of the little secrets or little tips I'll show you on here, guys, when they suspect this pump has gone bad, is they're gonna pull this regulator off the top of this thing and inspect it for debris. There's a lot going on inside this thing and when it doesn't go right, this is gonna be your failure. This is the shaft that drives those pistons. Okay, those pistons are inside, are actually driven through this bucket with a roller. Now that roller is supposed to be across this thing like this, parallel to it. What's gonna happen now is due to contamination, due to lack of fuel, due to lack of lubricant, it's gonna wind up and instead of being across this, okay, we're gonna wind up with it twisting and it riding like this. And that's what we see happened here. This bucket, which is not indexed to the bore, shifted. It went 90 degrees and we're now gouging this pump or this shaft. All that metal that was there is now throughout the entire fuel system. And if you take a peek down here as I enlarge this, if you look at the end of that 
fuel volume control valve, that metal is what used to be on that roller and on that shaft. This, as I mentioned before, you can pull this off, and if you see that, you're done. Go give the customer an application for a loan because you're looking at catastrophic failure at this point. Metal, little particles like that, this thing's not a very good filter of very fine metal. All that metal gets through everything, and you're going to need one repair kit at that point. So if you see shavings down here, you're done at that point. So you can't just throw a high-pressure pump in this thing and expect it to last. Those shavings are going to find their way back to that high-pressure pump, and they're going to cause you to do this all over again. We want to prevent the comebacks by watching what we're doing. All right, enough of the fuel system. Let's talk about the uh, turbochargers, the induction system. Uh, I'm going to assume everybody knows how a turbocharger works. One of the big things we're going to use is a wastegate. That wastegate is going to limit the amount of boost on this thing. In this very early system, we would bleed off some high pressure, bring it directly over to the wastegate. When we overcame the tension of that spring, we would then open this valve and dump exhaust, thereby limiting our boost pressure on today's more modern engines. So we're going to put some sort of electronic control in here to increase our boost. Instead of 14, 15 pounds of boost, we're going to go to 30 pounds of boost, all electronically controlling. And big thing to understand is this shaft in here, we're going to drive the turbine side with the exhaust gas, and that's going to spin the compressor side. We're going to bring it in. This thing can spin in excess of 100,000 RPMs. That's why these things are oil lubricated, main oil engine lubricated, and also cooled by engine coolant. So when you're starting to do forensics on these things, you got to find out, well, why did this turbocharger fail? Duramax LB7 turbocharger, uh, the wastegate sits right on top. There's a good example of that hose from the boost. We've got no electronic boost control on this thing whatsoever. It's going to do what it's designed to do and be done at that. The intercooler, or if you want to call it charge air cooler, because we're going to be compressing air, we're going to create heat. Heat is no good. We want cool air. So in this case, we've got an air-to-air -air intercooler. We're going to run our pressurized air through this thing, cool it, drop it into the intake, intake to the exhaust, fresh air coming in that. This is a drawing 5.9 uh, turbo off a of Cummins, very simple system. Turbocharger, bring it through, bring it over. No EGRs, no nothing, no simple stuff. I mentioned before the PCM boost control. Here we're going to throw a solenoid in, let the PCM control our boost. If we take some of this boost pressure and bleed it off with this solenoid, we can keep the wastegate closed longer and increase the amount of boost, a lot of times doubling that pressure. But then again, that's all PCM controlled based upon other engine inputs, other sensors to the PCM and what our right foot's doing. Dodge on the Cummins turbochargers, the earlier ones, the, the, uh, waste, the turbo wastegate control was actually a solenoid that mounted into the uh, compressor side of the turbocharger. Big issue we had with these things is this wire would break. This turbocharger sat right near the front tire on the, on the passenger side. A lot of splash would get up there and it would do damage to that wire. So you would then lose boost at that point. We've gone to what we call variable geometry turbochargers. These turbochargers have evolved. We're doing more things with them. Uh, they're part of the regen process, part of other things. So they've had to start messing with them internally. They basically all do it the same way, but everybody's different. And this particular one, we're going to use oil pressure. We're going to bring oil up through a bearing over here, through a cam bearing. There's an oil drain hole for the lube, and you've also got uh, uh, lube, lube pressure coming up. But we're going to use that solenoid to vary the geometry of the turbocharger. That solenoid is replaceable. This is a General Motors over here also. Okay, this does have a position sensor. So there is a position sensor to tell the turbo where it is or tell the computer where it's at. On this, we had no position sensor. They used what was called inferred the turbo position. General Motors actually put a position sensor on it that provided the feedback. Now, our variable geometry uh, kind of worked like this. At low flow, you're sitting there at idle. We would close down these doors, these gates. That would cause the exhaust gas to accelerate and hit the turbine and speed it up quicker. 
to get it turned. It was also used as a, a as a cold engine warm up device, keeping some of the exhaust heat in the exhaust manifolds. But as we got going down the road, we had to open these up because we now had more exhaust volume, more exhaust mass. So the computer's constantly varying these things. I like this shot better. This give, gives you a good idea. There's your at idle, okay, kind of like airplane wings, little nozzles that hit it. And then once you started going, those veins would open up to allow more exhaust flow. But one of the big problems with these is we are exhaust driven. Now, Ford eventually went to a dual turbocharger where they actually mounted two turbochargers on top of the engine, one low pressure, as they called it, and one high pressure. We had a turbo actuator control arm on the high pressure one to control those veins at that point. And we used a smaller turbo. Uh, we wanted more horsepower. We wanted more air. We couldn't increase the size of the turbo. So they, they just put two of them together, which created some problems. And there's kind of a picture of it, one turbo and the other turbo. There's your wastegate control, or not, not your wastegate, your, uh, your variable geometry actuator, electrically driven by the computer. So it's constantly varying at that point. Quick schematic of there is we would take our uh, exhaust gas, hit the uh, turbine, st turbine side of that. There's our dual compressors. This is off the 6.7. It's, it's still got its dual compressor design, but it's not turbo two turbochargers. We're just going to bring in sucking air from two different ways, bring it out, run it for our charge air cooler. Now, Ford 6.7 does use a water to air charge air cooler. And now we've got our EGR throttle body. A lot has he changed. A lot has evolved. This turbocharger, the sequential turbo off the 6.7, does use a solenoid to run oil pressure to one side or the other side of a piston, which makes the very variable geometry change. By the way, since we're talk, talking about, about some of this, we do have separate Ford, uh, GM, and Dodge uh, turbo training classes where we go into this in a lot, a lot more extensive than that. So this is kind of just a superficial. So uh, now unique to the Dodge Cummings in 07 was they went to a whole set turbocharger, a completely different design. It used an electronic variable vein geometry, but it wasn't a very vein. It was a slide that moved in and out. These are a common failure item because the turbocharger itself carbons up and it won't let that electric motor move that slide in and out. Talking about these turbos, <laughs> boy, where do we see that, see that before? Okay, clean air and clean oil. And then if you have to put a turbocharger on, you got to ask this question, why did it fail? Was it an electrical issue? If it was, it should have coded. Okay, there's a lot of electrical, uh, your waste gates, your, uh, act, your, your VV, v, BGT actuators. Okay, theirs are all electrically driven. They should code for you. Always verify oil supply and make sure before you put the new, tu tu new turbo on, as you crank the motor and watch, watch oil squirt out of that supply tube, make sure the return tube works. Be sure the charge air plumbing is good. No, no air leaks. And, and uh, what do your air filters look like? Okay, just an example, uh, air filter inspection, you'll notice this thing's mangled pretty good. Well, in this particular vehicle, the gasoline air filter fits in the diesel engine's air filter housing. This gasoline filter is not made to handle the volume of air. So it deformed and actually separated, which caused turbo damage. Here's a good shot of the two different filters. Uh, yeah, you can put the less expensive gas one in. It fits, but it ain't going to stand up. A lot, lot of these uh, diesel filters are reinforced. I've seen where they put glue strips down on to reinforce them, even in some cases metal or plastic. Here's another good one of a cheap filter. If, you, if I zoom in over here, if you'll notice in the middle of the air filter is that silver cap. Okay, well, the air filter they pulled out of this vehicle was missing that silver cap. I wonder where the silver cap went. At this point, this turbocharger is junk and probably is the, the entire engine would have suffered catastrophic failure at that. So understand the importance of good air filters. The hose inspection always do these clamps. On this particular one, this Dodge, they've, they've got these clamps. Okay, there's a torque value on those. 
these hoses should never be put on with any kind of lubricant. If you don't torque these bolts to the right torque, they're going to pop off anyhow. So inspect all this. Air charge coolers. This has got plastic tanks with metal fins. Those plastic tanks can rupture, can break. This is where an aftermarket may not be a bad idea. When in, when in doubt, inspect that thing. You can pressure test charge air coolers. You're going to need some adapter sets. And you pressurize them about 25 to 30 pounds. Make sure they hold pressure. Make sure they don't leak. Troubleshooting. Yeah, do you have trouble codes? A lot of times you get overboost, underboost. Is that turbocharger making a bunch of noise? Am I down on power? Do I have smoke? Notice over here on the inlet side of this turbocharger is a puddle of oil. Well, that's going to get in. That's going to give you your smoke, your blue smoke coming out. Is this because the seal failed or is it because there's another problem? These things have closed crankcase ventilation systems. They, they can suck oil through the crankcase. Common codes, PO299 for overboost or for underboost, 234 for overboost. You're going to get electrical codes for the solenoids, and you can get range performance codes. It doesn't mean a turbo is necessarily bad. Something else could be malfunctioning at that point. Causes of underboost, now you're not getting enough boost. This wastegate stuck open. These things are, are defaulted closed. If they should stick open, well, you're going to be bypassing all the time. Big one is leaks between the compressor and the throttle. Charge air cooler leaks, hose leaks. The clamps weren't tight and they got the wrong clamps. Uh, some of these manufacturers have gone to positive connect type things. You have to push them in, quarter turn to pull them off. Well, did that get seated correctly or is it kind of loose on there? Causes of underboost, wastegate stuck, of, oh, excuse me, overboost. Okay, wastegate stuck closed. If that doesn't open, you're going to overboost. The computer will realize that and take protective actions. Again, control hoses. Now, these are control hoses to the wastegate assembly. I don't know how well I can zoom in on that. If you'll notice over there, the fitting coming off of the can, the fitting right here, the hose is off. Hose is dangling in the air over there off on the side. That's going to cause overboost. It's not going to open. Uh, wastegate vent solenoid stuck in the vent position. Yeah, it's an electric solenoid. It's going to get contaminated. Could be in the vent position. I like manual pressure check on here. You use your mighty vac, your hand pressure. Gear. Turbo damage, whistling, whining noises, uh, sea sluggish. The engine off. You can pull the intake hose off that turbo and give that shaft a little spin. It should just freewheel. If it's sticking or binding, you're done at that point. Is there any up and down side clearance? Excessive clearance in there, you're done at that point. I've seen some where the shafts were so worn, it actually gouged the housing. All that aluminum went into the motor. We do supply a full line of turbochargers for Fords, from the earlier ones to the later ones. Pattern failure on some of the earlier ones. Now, the, 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 this is the one with the variable geometry. You got a unison plate that's driven. The uh, little cam over here has got a little pin. That little pin's going to fit into that slot on a unison ring. Each one of these little wings fits into the groove. And as this thing spins, it opens or closes them. This particular one is suffering from a lot of carbon. You can take these things apart and clean them and service them if you want to call it that. Inspect that unison ring. It is replaceable. This one's got about a fair amount of wear and a couple of these to where the uh, thing was actually sticking. Your oil control solenoid is there. And on a Ford, on this particular engine, six liters, the oil drain was underneath and was held in by O-rings. Well, Ford didn't think you'd ever drive this thing in winter weather, so they didn't coat this thing. This tube rotted out, and what it would give you is an oil leak on the top of the engine. This wasn't pressurized oil. All our replacement tubes, and I suggest if you do take the turbo off, you replace the turbo or just take it off and put it back on, you automatically stick a new tube on there just to prevent your problems. GM turbocharger assemblies, uh, 01 through uh, 2016, are pretty much the same. Uh, modern on the top, top of the motor. This particular one has no wastegate control early. Here's your wastegate, uh, wastegate control there. Uh, your variable geometry at that point. Go from there. These are all available. And here, I did mention that quarter turn before. Make sure that's on there uh, fastened correctly. 
some of the earlier ones actually had also had a hose clamp. So you would quarter turn this thing on and put the hose clamp on. Okay, this particular one, it doesn't, it just makes sure it's sealed. The O-ring right there is going to do your sealing, a blue, a blue O-ring. Some of the early GMs, the LLY motors, uh, had problems with cam bearing issues. Okay, they brought engine oil up through number four cam bearing through that little feed hole to the actuator assembly on a turbocharger. This bearing had a tendency to, to, to walk in the bore which now shut that little bleed hole off so you didn't get oil up to the uh, variable geometry solenoids. So you had a performance problem. A lot of times you yeah, also accompanied by black smoke because you didn't have enough air coming into this thing. GM said replace that bearing and the new bearing has got a wider hole and an elongated hole to uh, allow more bearing walk. The Dodge diesels are uh, pretty straight forth in the beginning and then they went to the Holstead over here with the electronics on the side. Uh, Dodge is the only one with that, by, by the way. Be careful on these things. Uh, find out why this, if you are coding for that motor, find out why it did fail. Now, just to give you a little breakdown of this a variable geometry turbocharger, carbon is a big issue. This sleeve right here, okay, instead of wings that open or close, they're gonna slide this sl sl sleeve out. This sleeve is then gonna cover up these wings. And those wings don't change position. What happens if carbon buildup on that sleeve just doesn't allow the electric motor to actuate the arm? You wind up burning out the motor because this arm is frozen. If that arm is frozen, you got to replace the turbocharger. Now, if you're just going to put this in here, make sure that you twist that by hand. It should move fairly freely. If not, Dodge did have a TSB to do the... Uh, VG turbo cleaning procedure. They actually had a kit. You had to drill and tap a hole in the turbocharger to which you would then feed some carbon cleaning solution while the engine was running. And what the computer did was try to cycle this thing back and forth to clean that carbon out. And when you got done, they gave you a plug to plug that hole up. Why did the turbo fail? Well, look at over here. This is on the compressor side. The impeller, the, okay, something got in there and just ate those fins up. This is on the turbine side, the exhaust side. Something came through that motor and bent those things. So you're probably uh, not replacing a turbocharger. You're putting an entire engine on this thing at this point. Got to find out why that turbo failed. You just throw a new one on, you're probably look, looking at lots of pain and headache. Sufficient oil supply. Remember, these things are generally fed through the valley of the intake or through internal passages. This is not the way to securely hold a gasket in place while you're putting the turbocharger in. Okay, if you're going to do anything, put a little grease on this thing, a little spray gasket material. That chunk is going to break off and going to wind up getting into the turbo. It's going to block the oil return or the oil flow. You're going to wipe out that impeller shaft. Insufficient lubrication here. You ran it without oil. Dirt in oil. These things sit on bearings. There's a bearing that sits there. Dirty oil got into this thing and just gouged the living snot out of that, that thing. And on this particular one, it actually wound up spitting the bearing a little bit. Change the oil. Use good filters. Yeah, I know an oil change on these things is expensive. Carbon buildup. Uh, yeah, if you ride these things hard, this turbo is going to get hot. Dodge is the only one, by, by the way, that actually gives the customer a chart of cool down times. So if you're on the freeway and you're pulling pretty hard, you're pulling for fuel, don't shut it off right away. Give it a few minutes for the turbocharger to cool down. Otherwise, whatever oil was in here is going to get coked. It's going to get cooked. That's going to wind up damaging your bearings and could possibly seize the turbocharger. Use the high quality oil. Use the correct oil for the engine. Degraded oil quality can carbonize in, in service. Installation tips uh, before you do any repair. Yeah, check the oil supply before you take it apart. Check the oil. Was there a sufficient oil in it? Make sure you're going to put fresh oil and fresh filters. I don't like the word check. I'm going to put replace, air filter. Make sure you prime this system. Prime it both oil-wise and fuel-wise. Remember I talked about on the, com or on the uh, Duramax, push that pump until your finger turns blue. If you got an electric pump, turn the key to the on position. 
Ford's electric fuel pump will run for 30 seconds and then shut off. Do that about 10 times. That's going to move fuel through the entire system, actually have some returning back. You can do the same thing on the newer Cummins. And again, uh, suggest I'd let you, you let any of these things idle before you shut them down, just to let that turbocharger cool down a bit. Good way to check the oil and coolant is here we've got the, uh, we're doing a turbocharger replacement. The oil drain line, the uh, pressure line coming in. Make sure you got oil. Uh, some of you guys remember doing a fuel volume test. Yeah, take that little container, crank the engine for 15 seconds. How much oil is in that container when you're done? If you got just a little bit, you got more serious problems, you may have to replace the supply line. Make sure the drain line is not plugged because that's how the oil gets out of the turbo. Make sure you got a free path to the, to the crankcase. Matter of fact, if you can, replace that little drain tube. Here, 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 here he's showing. Okay, he's doing that volume test. Okay, crank it for about 15 seconds and collect your oil in your container. That's going to be dirty. It's going to be yucky. And that's a good idea here. You're also flushing oil. So do this before you bolt the new turbocharger up. Make sure it's charged. Replace your filters. There's your air filter. This also on the Dodge Cummage. You've got a crankcase ventilation filter, crankcase breather filter. I'd replace it also just to prevent comebacks. Once the uh, installation is finished, disable fuel and crank the engine to prime the turbo lines and bearings. Start the engine, allow it to idle, let the oil build up, and then go take it for a road test. Make sure when you come back, you check for uh, codes, make sure there are none. Allow the engine to idle for a few minutes before shutting it off. Let that turbo cool down. Just some general stuff over here. What's your fuel look like? And use a good, good quality fuel filter. That filter is designed to shed water. A lot of your cheaper ones do not shed water. Let water go right through. Water has no lubricating principles. Take a fuel sample. Is it nice and clean? Does it look like diesel fuel? Or does it look like somebody pulled from the crankcase and dumped it in the fuel tank? Could also be some contaminants. Good, clean fuel is important. Do a visual inspection. Take a peek. You might find your problem from here. What's your oil look like? Is it full? Diesel oil, the only time diesel oil is clean is when you're pouring it from the bottle into the engine. So as soon as it gets the engine, it looks dirty. But uh, I think you all know what the diesel oil looks like. So check it. It's important. Uh, make sure you've got the correct oil in. I'm going to pause here for a second. What's wrong with this picture? Everybody see it? That little uh, munched up crushed thing over there uh, looks kind of dirty. The air filter is not doing a very good job of filtering the air. As a matter of fact, if you look at that turbocharger, it looks to be brand new. Uh, I wonder how long this one's going to last due to unfiltered air. Not all mods are bad. I kind of like this idea. This is off of the Dodge Cummins. That's a fuel filter assembly. I believe there's an electric fuel pump in there too. The lift pump at that point. Kit to do this. The only problem with this is I've seen these mounted on a few vehicles. And you better have some pretty big tires on here to keep this thing from scraping the ground. Because it does protrude uh, a fair amount. Not a bad idea for that. Intercoolers. It's another thing. Intercoolers. If you have problems, get a good quality inter intercooler. If you do suspect you've got fuel leaks internal, because a lot of these things, the injectors are underneath the valve covers, go ahead and add fuel dye. Now, don't dump it in the fuel tank. Dump it in the filter assembly on top of the engine. Start the engine and run it. Ford has you doing a test like this. Then run the engine here. He's got the valve cover off. He's looking for fuel leaks. This particular one had a cracked fuel injector. The injector body actually cracked, was leaking fuel into the uh, crankcase itself. So a uh, dye can help you for, for find stuff. A little bit of new stuff uh, just to help you guys out. Uh, if you go to our website, standardbrand.com, and you click on over in the corner, Knowledge Center. The Knowledge Center is going to take you to the GM, the Dodge, or the Ford, and break it down, down by power plant. Go ahead and click on those links. You, you want help. In understanding how to replace something or what you need to do, these are valuable links to do that. We're going to click on this six-liter power stroke just to give you an example. 
We've got the diesel fuel injector, uh, injector high pressure oil pumps, 7.3 stuff in here. But we're going to give you some videos on what to look for, what to help you. Try to help you avoid the pain that somebody else may have had or the pain that you experienced. Fuel injector installation, things like that. This is a free resource on our website. Please use it when you can. Kind of help you out. Here's uh, part of the Blue Spring Update Kit for the uh, fuel pressure system, the low pressure fuel system on this thing. It's a good thing to make sure that's been done. Even if you don't know if it's been done, do it again. It's real easy to do. And you can follow the videos. When in doubt, as you open the box of our standard brand parts, okay, you're going to see that. You have any questions whatsoever about the installation of this thing, about what you should do, what you shouldn't do. Call that 800 numbers. There's some pretty intelligent guys on the end of that phone. They're going to walk you through some of the steps, give you some tips and hint, hints and tips of what you need to do. Also, uh, this should be coming in all new boxes at this point. Here are important things to know before you install the 6-liter diesel fuel injector. A lot of what I just told you. And then again, you've got that 800 number. Don't be afraid to ask for help. It's just a lot cheaper to do it this way, believe me. Some other instruction sheets when you get parts in a box, you've got those available. You also got a QR code up in the corner. You can scan it, scan it with your phone. And that'll take you to the website. Something new we're kind of putting in here is these fuel test swabs. Fuel test testing is important. So when you get that new injector, you're going to have this swab kit in it. And what we want you to do is take a sample, follow the instructions on the card, take a fuel sample and compare what that fuel looks like to the card. It'll tell you if there's anything wrong with the fuel. You can also do it at the tank. Contamination that's going to look for fuel oxidation, water, rust scale, sludge, asphaltine, stuff like that. Anything that's going to wipe out fuel injection pro issues. Now, just a couple of slides here to show you what we're seeing coming back to us as warranty. These fuel injectors over here, if you'll notice that one is nice, bright, and shiny, where the other two are pretty well coked up. Now, he did put this together right. But the problem was he did use new copper O-rings down the bottom. What the problem was, when he put these injectors in, he did not torque them down correctly. That's going to allow, this is exhaust. It's going to rapidly kill these injectors at this point. So when we tell you a torque value is important, a lot of times we're going to give it to you on the sheet that comes with these things. Make sure you follow those. This was a simple injector failure because he didn't torque the injectors down correctly. Some other issues, over torquing or not using a torque wrench. You're going to snap bolts off. Now these injectors uh, do have core value on them. This particular injector with that broken stud no longer has a core value. It is broken, it is gone at that point. So you're looking at uh, whatever the core charge was. The injector in the middle during installation he installed the O-ring incorrectly, and you'll notice the piece of O-ring. Well, this is causing a fuel leak inside the motor. If this thing should work loose and get inside the ejector. It could cause possible engine damage. What's even worse on this other one, this is really bad. This is the high-pressure pump assembly. The guy put a brand new one in the engine, buttoned everything up, and went to start it. This did not make one revolution. What happened here was a piece of garbage got stuck between the cam gear and the pump drive gear and destroyed that pump. Brand new pump was destroyed. So be careful. Make sure things are clean. Make sure things aren't in the way. Picture on the left is the primary fuel filter on the 6-liter Ford F-Series. What you see is water damage. This is water damage in the uh, fuel filter assembly. Center picture is a CP3 high-pressure pump contaminated with DEF fluid. DEF fluid goes in the other tank, not the diesel tank. If you'll notice, that DEF fluid got in there and that entire pump blew up. I mean, it came apart. This wasn't we cut it in half or we banged it in half. This was it blew up. DEF fluid will do that. And then this one uh, over here is the uh, that fuel pressure regulator I showed you before. This is off of Duramax. That's the high pressure pump pieces off of a CP4 pump. So pull that up and take care of it. 
This is kind of a corny slide. It goes against everything we've been talking about. <laughs> okay, but eh, people still do it. Uh, while many diesel enthusiasts enjoy using performance upgrades on their vehicles, we cannot warranty parts that are used in these applications. So if you've got a vehicle like this and you put parts in it, any manufacturer's parts, something happens with it, expect them to deny your warranty claim. This applies when you do stuff like this. It puts stress levels on these diesel components that these engine that these components were really not designed for, because we manufacture everything to meet aftermarket specs. Now we do go above that, okay, just to protect ourselves. But you got to be careful on that. And if this sounds like I'm yelling at you or something, I'm I don't mean to. It's just it's having been a technician, having known what it takes to do some of this stuff. It's just Let's do it right the first time. It's easier, cheaper that way. And 